Hi everyone, uh, this is Dr. Kim's Scholarship and Journey. Welcome to my channel. Um, today's topic is the parable of the tenants. And this parable is found in all three Gospels. But before we study this parable, we have to remember the last three uh, seed parables, which are the source parable and the seed growing secretly in Mark and the mustard seed parable. In all those you know, parables of seed, we saw the atmosphere of a peace, so to speak, very ironic environment in agricultural society. Somehow the sower you know, went out to sow the seeds and uh, watching the seeds growing and so forth and the seed growing secretly, you know, in most other plant and seed growing in different uh, place. So much so we have seen kind of ironic, you know, peaceful environment. But in this parable we're going to study today, it's not ironic, but violent. And also things are discussed here. It's not just growing, you know, things like a farming society, but human relations issue you know, tenants and uh, slaves and master and so forth. So we'll explore more or less this uh, interesting parable of tenants. So overview of uh, this parable, this parable deals with the different issues, you know, in society, social relations and the social issues such as the land, who owns the land, who lost the land, right? Land lease. Who are tenants or farmers? Certainly we see here kind of economic uh, justice issues. And certainly we see different metaphorical associations with the kingdom of God, right? So who is the landowner? You know, what is the vineyard like? Who are working there? Who are tenants there? What kind of people are they? who are servants of this master. And actually, uh, this parable of tenants is extremely hard to interpret because there are some textual issues, okay? There are also, you know, Jesus' original uh, context, which we do not know. So it's hard to tell, you know, what this parable about because we do not know much about the Jesus' own context you know, not alone, you know, the evangelists, Mark, Matthew, and Luke on context. So also this parable uh, includes the evangelist editing, okay, uh, allegorical interpretation, which makes us so much difficult to understand this parable. So let's read uh, this parable in Mark. Then he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, and dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to the tenants and went to another country. When the season came and he sent a slave to the tenants to collect from them his share of the produce of the vineyard, but they seized him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Interesting. And again, he sent another slave to them. This one, they beat over the head and insulted. Then he sent another, and that one they killed. So at the third time, right, they killed one slave. And so it was with many others, they did the same thing. Some they beat and others they killed like that. He has still one other, which is a beloved son, right? The last beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them saying, they will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, this is the heir, come and let's kill him and the inheritance will be ours. So they seized him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? 
the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. And it's amazing in our eyes. When they realized that he had told this parable against them, they wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowd. So they left him and went away. Now Matthew, see what Matthew tells Mark and you know, version a little differently, okay? Mark has a source. Matthew changes a little bit, not much. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner immediately here, right? In Mark, we heard a man planted a vineyard, but Matthew specifies that person to be a landowner, planted a vineyard and put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, the harvest, he sent his slaves to the tenants. So this is different, his slaves. In Mark, a single slave each time, right, sent. But here, his slaves, plural, to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves, plural, beat one and killed another and stoned another. Even at first time, one of them, slaves, was killed. Again, he sent another, other slaves, more than the first. More slaves are sent, okay? It's kind of a degree is increasing, tense is higher. And they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, his son to them saying, they will respect my son. In Mark, we heard him saying, you know, a beloved son, but anyway, this is my son, kind of only son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir, come, let's kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Now, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? It's kind of a concluding question, rhetorical, rhetorical question. What will he do to do those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and uh, lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it's amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. So this section that I just have read is a new, okay? So Matthew certainly uh, included more than a mark. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them and they wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds and so because they regarded him as prophet. Now let's look at the parable in Luke. Luke tells a Markham parable and changing a little bit and sometimes kind of refining and simplifying the Markham version. He began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and leased it to tenants and went to another country for a long time. So Luke here changing, right? For a long time. Luke says, for a long time, which means Yes, they stay there for a long time, but certainly would come back. There's kind of a signal that okay, a man would come back. When the season came, he sent a slave to the tenant, a single slave each time, in order that they might give him his share of the produce of the vineyard. But the tenant beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Next, he sent another slave that, that one also they beat and insulted and sent away empty-handed. And he sent a, still a third slave, but this one also they wounded and threw out. Very interesting. Up to third time, okay? No, not a single slave was killed, although they were treated, you know, harsh, I mean, wounded and thrown out. But unlike Mark or Matthew, Luke says, the slaves sent by, you know, the master was not killed. 
Then the owner of the vineyard said, well, what shall I do? I'll send my beloved son like a mark. Beloved son, perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they discussed it among themselves and said, this is there, let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him, just like Matthew and Mark. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? The same rhetorical question. He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When they heard this, they said, heaven forbid, heaven forbid. But he looked at them and said, what then does this text mean? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. All three texts, as you have read, differ from each other one way or another, but not in significant ways. Why, you know, Matthew and Luke are different from Mark? Because they changed it in their own ways. As I already pointed out while I was reading, right? In Matthew, we see a landlord, not just a man, like in Mark, okay, a landlord who planted a vineyard and sent his multiple slaves at each time and many times, right? And uh, also, you know, one of the slaves was killed even at the first time, right? It's a more harsh treatment of the slaves, you know, we see in Mark's story. Uh, finally, you know, the vineyard was given to other farmers, okay, not just to others, so more specific, other tenants, in other words, and who will deliver their produce at the proper time, in Mark simply saying, you know, to others. What about in Luke? Luke really uh, simplified certain details, I mean, does not include some, you know, details about it the vineyard, right? A man dug, you know, did this thing, put a fence around thing, those things just cut those out. Just simply a man planted a vineyard and went abroad for an extended time, definite emphasis we do not see in Matthew or in uh, Mark, but only here in Luke. The guy, right? Went abroad for an extended time, you know, for a long time, but he would come back to see how, right, his tenants are doing, kind of expecting something. So that's different emphasis in Lucan Gospel. And also interestingly, slaves are not killed, but only the one, right, whom the guy loves. In other words, the beloved son, the last final son, that was killed, but otherwise the slaves were not killed. That's interesting. So as we saw previously, so if I point out the textual issues, textual issues, one important question is, where is the end of the original parable of Jesus? When he spoke the parable, like this one, where he supposed to end? I mean, what's the real end of the story? So based on Mark, we can figure out, okay, probably uh, some, as some suggest, Verse 8, maybe the end of the original parable, where Jesus says, so they seized him, right, and killed him, and threw him out of the vineyard. Then what happened? The all inheritance will be theirs, I mean tenants. So tenants will be happy, right, even with the violent kind of a killing and resistance, all those things. Somehow, if, you, if we think of verse 8 is the last verse, so the lesson might be different from other endings, right? So certainly revolution is taken for granted. Resistance, even violent resistance taken for granted, right? The verse 9a, if that is the end, the rhetorical question here, we see what then will the owner of the vineyard do? So all sorts of, uh, you know, answers. Uh, one of them is kind of, uh, you know, you have to treat 
these all tenants who are killing and injuring all his right slaves somehow that must must be some consequence so you have to answer right whether you know all this violence resistance killing beating injuring is it legitimate a good or not or some people say you know verse 12 i mean the the text that you have in in, in the case of mark right so they may be the original ending but some suggest that might not be the original ending but mark you know extended the original parable including some scriptural quote and uh, allegorizing you know this text so as i said uh, the evangelists you know may have added uh, uh, more text here uh, with allegory allegory so there is we see a harsh treatment of the tenants right very harsh treatment judgment of them and killing all of them and also giving the land the right vineyard to others or other uh, farmers uh, so there is certain uh, allegorical interpretation here right so we'll see all those things here uh, on the next slide so how can you interpret what are some options we can interpret this typical parable one option as i hinted already if jesus parable ends at verse 8 right so they seized him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard then the lesson might be what jesus means to say this resist the harsh rule of the master right you have a right to resist in whatever ways get your freedom to be yours resist or if the story ends at verse 9a the with the rhetorical question here what then will the owner of the vineyard do right so because you know all the uh, tenants you know kill the slaves kind of thing that's not good thing so maybe the implication you see here maybe non-violent resistance is implied that's what the master wants we don't know but somehow we can think that way okay probably do resistance but do it with non-violent way that might be a connotation we don't know or you may read the, the current text as a whole mark you know verse 1 through 12 then we have to attend to markan interpretation allegorical interpretation mark tells us you know this parable of jesus for clear purpose in its context you know considering the vineyard owner as god right the man is god actually you know allegory the vineyard owner as god and vineyard as israel and servants as prophets okay so many you know uh, prophets were sent in you know old testament history right the beloved son the final son here right sent by this guy may represent a jesus in allegorical terms so the beloved son as jesus tenants right workers in the vineyards now they are jewish leaders and those who inherit the vineyard finally right as the gentile christians like a Markham community Markan Christians. So Mark uses this parable in its own context to tell the community, right? Jesus is the final son, beloved, and Messiah, right? Through whom a new community of the beloved may be formed and flourish. So Mark has a clear intention. But our task is not just to go with the Mark, but what about the the original parable of Jesus. What does he intend to mean? What can we get uh, from his own original parable? That's the issue. 
So here the question is, what's your take on this parable? In other words, what's your stand? We already saw these things, but let me just repeat. From Jesus' perspective, the issue might be whether we can raise an aggressive resistance, like a tenant in the story, or with a rhetorical question, right? Will, will what the owner of the you know, vineyard do to these violent resistors? Then the answer may be nonviolent resistance, maybe what we need. But from Markham perspective, we understand why Mark, you know, changed and tell the parable of Jesus in such a way, right? Allegorically, as we just saw. But one of the issues we have to raise as modern readers, how to justify, how to justify the harsh treatment of the tenants? What's wrong with them? Because they are all landless. They are treated fairly bad in society where landlords are just what well, everything they're just all powerful right they're you know exploiting tenants in that situation if you leave that situation what would you do right so that's a hard issue harsh issue is the allegory working with you if you follow all these allegorical associations right in this story According to Mark, do you follow? Are you happy? What's going on with here? Right? Can you take that story allegorically and literally somehow? So supersessionism means a replacement of Judaism and Old Testament, right? Jews, it's kind of a Christians and the church can take over and replace the Old Testament, all those things, supersessionism. It's kind of a triumphant, the victory and gospel is that okay with the Merkham community and with us? That's the issue, right? And furthermore, you need to think about, you know, what are some good things we can take away from the Merkham view of the mission to the world? Yes, there are some good things, you know, Merkham mission strategy to the world. How does Mark treat the world, you know? And with the new Messiah, what do they want to do? So all sort of these things are coming to us so that we have to decide which way we should go. So the parable of Jesus still continue to be told and retold and to fit in, you know, in our context. So finally, reflection questions. Think about the situation of the tenants in the first century Palestine, especially in Galilee, right? Think about their lives. If you're hired on a daily basis with poor wage, what can you do? What are your options? Where is the kingdom of God? What would you do if you are peasants? It's very realistic, you know, social questions, justice issues. But on the other hand, we have to deal with the Markan allegorical, allegorical interpretation of a Jesus parable. Okay? So, what can we say about it, right? Good and bad. We did not talk about Matthew and Lucan interpretation in particular, but that is another matter, right? We have to discuss separately, you know, why Matthew, you know, uh, changed a little bit of the story here and there, why Luke changed here and there a little bit there, you know, in overall narrative of Luke or Matthew, right? How is this parable fitting in its uh, kind of a, a program, right? So that's another issue. So let me finish here and thank you for watching my video. And uh, as you know, in this series, I'll continue to uh, make uh, new videos and uh, I will do until I cover all the parables that I promised to use. So I'm, I'm thinking, you know, 23 uh, major parables will be uh, uh, dealt with in my uh, second, you know, YouTube channel. And not, I mean, the, the playlist. So I'll cover all of them. So I'll see you next time. And uh, uh, remember, uh, if you like it, and please like it and uh, subscribe to this channel. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much. And I hope to see you next time. Bye-bye.